Hello and welcome to Accelerate. I am Matt Stone. This is the podcast where we encourage and inspire CEOs, founders, and visionaries on their big leap journeys. We talk about the stories and strategies that help you accelerate toward your big leap destination with purpose, humility, an open mind, commitment to growth, and recognition that the way we get there is at least as important as where we end up. And I am so delighted today to be joined by the phenomenal and experienced and full of wisdom and great human being, Chris Holter. And so I'm just going to give you a little background on Chris, and then we'll dive into our conversation. Chris Holter is, uh, she's the president of Chris Holter Consulting. She's a former Fortune 200 executive, strategic advisor, executive coach. She helps leaders, teams, and organizations around the world increase their revenue, profit, and retain top talent by 10xing their performance to goals uh, through conscious leadership. She's considered the go-to executive coach and strategic advisor to leaders that want to break the mold and create a new way of working. Now, she launched uh, Holter Consulting in January of 2020 to maximize executive impact of today's leaders and to create more people in the world that can do what they do best every day, which in turn, of course, creates engagement and leads to more profit. So it's good for the business. And her focus is really around self-awareness, authenticity, and leveraging talents and collaboration. She's got over three decades of experience at Marriott International. Um, so I don't know how much she can share about what happened there, but over three decades, she's got some good stories, I'm sure. And for over 20 years, she led the revenue strategy of the Caribbean Latin American division, um, as they hit their revenue targets. And she did that through focusing on leadership development. And she was a real trailblazer because I believe, and we'll have to ask her, but she was the first international vice president. Uh, first international vice president of revenue strategy. Now, she's got an MBA in leadership from University of Nebraska. She's a strengths-based coach. She's got uh, all kinds of qualifications, creator of high-impact team method, uh, ICF ACC certified professional coach, master practitioner of the Energy Leadership Index, IPEC leadership, core dynamics specialist, positive in- intelligence coach. And if that's not enough... Now she's pursuing a master's of conscious leadership through the Conscious Leadership Institute. And I know, and I'm pretty sure I've only scratched the surface. So I'm going to stop there because I want to hear it from Chris herself. Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It is awesome to be here. And what an introduction. It makes me like sit about two inches taller in my chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, get used to it. <laughs> you are already that tall. And I, I'm i really excited. And I've, I've been thinking all week about this conversation and all the things that um, I'd like to talk about with you. But I just want to start off because anyone, and I've, I've actually talked, I, I talked with a Uh, In my former podcast, it was a different name, but it's sort of part of this podcast family, if you will. I talked with a a man who's still at United Airlines, but it's for like 40 years, 40 years. And and the kind of wisdom that a person with three or four decades in an organization has is really, I think, unique. I think you bring something to the table that not very many people have, especially now, because people don't stay in careers that long very much anymore. Um, so I guess what I want to start with is what has well, what is this leap from that life? And we'll get into the backstory as well. But moving from that into this new, it's me. I'm Chris. I'm not the VP at Marriott. I'm Chris Holter. Hi. How has that emotional journey been as part of the leap that you've done over the last couple of years? Oh my goodness. It's been quite a transformation. I, you know, I have transformed so many different times in my life. And, um, you know, when I decided to do it, it was like, I've created all this major success. I have a legacy and, you know, now it's time to figure out how to impact more people in a different way. And so emotionally, it's a little terrifying, I guess. And then at the same time, there's this like vision and this mission and this bigger than 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 you. And, and one of the things I did when I 
started is I surround myself with a couple of communities. And I had this amazing um, coach, Rich Lichtvin, and I was on his podcast. And on that podcast, I said, I want to impact a million people positively. And he, we really, I got this insight just from this one experience with him about, I don't have to coach a million people. I just have to coach really cool people doing amazing things that are making a big impact. And in turn, I, the ripple effect allows me to make an impact. And I think that changed everything for me when I learned that, because I'm like, oh, like, why didn't I think of that? Number one, and number two, I'm like, this is cool. So now I wanna really cultivate a practice where I'm really coaching people that are breaking the mold, that are doing super cool things, that are thinking differently, that are bringing a new way of leading to the world. And when I do that, that ripple effect will get me to that big mission. And I think now that I just keep holding that vision in my head every day. And, you know, I just keep trying new things. And for me, it's all about mastery and just, you know, mm. getting better at what I'm doing every day. And I know that million people impact will come. What, a couple different things that are coming up for me as you're talking. One is, uh, we can get so locked in our vision about the impact we want to have. Like like you said, I want to impact millions of people and then miss the boat around how that can happen because we've yeah. got these ideas about it. So staying open to how we get there, uh, which is kind of part of the theme of this podcast, actually, <laughs> is the way we get there is something that needs to be nurtured and changed. And we're constantly learning about that. And it can change over time and and we can have an even bigger impact than we thought, but not in the way that we thought we would. So. Absolutely. And that, I think you can hold the intent yeah. and go about it doing different things. So this all comes from this rich background I have and building out, you know, developing parts of the world for Marriott International um, for many years. But I learned through that process that you know, every year we would have a coup or we'd have some uh, political economic challenge or we'd have a natural disaster. And so we always had to build in a contingency plan. Oh. And so I really was about like, what's plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, or, you know, how do you just keep trying things until something takes? And that's really the same thing I've applied to being this lifestyle entrepreneur and strategic advisor. And that way it's fun. You, you just yeah. keep, and you don't get caught up in what doesn't work. You just keep, you know, kind of mastering and getting better. And, and I think my secret is when I don't know what to do, I go learn something. And so that's why that list keeps getting longer Gets on longer. the bio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get you. No, I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's in a sense, a blessing and a curse these days because it's all so accessible to, to all of us who want to do it. I mean, there's, you can take amazing free online college courses at Yale if you want to, you know, and so choosing what to spend your time on uh, sometimes is, is harder than actually getting access to it. Yeah, I think it's, it's I think it truly is if you don't know what to do and you're like, say you're frustrated or yeah. you feel like, you know, you're trying everything and it's not your fault. I mean, if you're ready to take that big leap, just go learn something. And you're right now learning is so accessible and then not just learn it, but like, how does this apply to what I want to do and go out then and teach somebody what you learned? That's always yeah. something I've done is learn it, teach it, learn it. And yeah. be committed, I guess, to whatever it is you decide to do. But it, it also creates momentum and that acceleration, like you'd like to call it, because it just keeps pushing the energy forward. Right. Yeah, it certainly does. Um, so going back to Marriott now, I, you know, we're going to talk about you've got a lot to give uh, leaders and, and help them on their journeys to get new insights and perform better by seeing themselves, you know, in, in more positive ways and things like that, being more conscious uh, but but I want to go back. Let's go back to very, very young Chris, <laughs> because if it was 30 years ago, you must have been a baby. I mean, I don't know when you started at Marriott, but you must have been very, very, very young. How did you get into the, the hospitality industry? You said you were working, you know, in a like an hourly job and you worked all the way up to VP of an international organization and multiple countries and all of that. But how did it all start? And 
And how did you, how did you, well, I, we'll get into how you navigated that. And, and as a woman too, that's another yeah. aspect of it. But how did, how did you get started at Marriott? Well, we, we can have a lot of fun with this, but my mom grew up in a hotel actually. And um, her, her father was one of the founding fathers of Michigan State University. And, and she thought I would be really good in hotels. Like my talents would lend myself. So <clears throat> I tried to go to Michigan State, but the only class I could get into was um, introduction to meat carving. So I said, I'm not doing that. And I'm going to stay away from that. But I got a business degree. And then I really did start at the front desk of the Hilton Head Marriott. And um, they had a really cool leadership development program. So think about this, like if you have these programs in place, it really does create leaders. So they would have in season, they'd have two front desk managers and then one would get promoted and go away. And in the winter when it was slower, they only needed the one. And then they would promote a supervisor the next summer. And so it was a process that this organization or this particular hotel had in place. And I was the beneficiary by hard work and doing a great job. And, but the whole time I always knew, again, it was this intuitiveness about my talent and that I loved really complex things. And I wanted to be involved in like the cash registers ringing and reservations and sales. And so it took me a long time to get there. I had to do a management training program for um, reservations on the side, like on my days off. But mm -hmm. I'm like, this is what I want to do. This is my calling. And I think for all of us, it's about find an organization um, that aligns to your values. And that's one of the reasons that I stayed at Marriott International for many years, because it, they have this great spirit to serve. And mm. that was kind of what I believed in was taking care of, you know, people so they could take care of the customers. And so aligning your values, I guess, is one thing with a company, you know, and making sure that the two go together. So that worked for me. And then number two, you really want to find um, something that you're really good at doing, that you enjoy, that you're passionate about. And as soon as I got into revenue management, I'm like, this is it. I'm home. And tell me I more about that. What um, was it about? Because I most people, if they hear those words, revenue management, they don't think about human connection and heart and all of that. And yet there's a lot of connection between those two. And, and that's one of the areas I want to explore with you. Oh, that's awesome. Well, revenue management is really maximizing the demand. And in hotels, you do it through pricing and inventory management. And what I love too, is you're right there by the cash register, right? You're, you're handling right. the reservations department and customer calls, and you're getting to hear what the customers are looking for. But I loved it because it was just like, if I can find a way to help make the cash registers ring more, we can bring more guests in to have these amazing experiences. And then as I got into like my really big first job, like with multiple hotels, you know, I, I actually really struggled to be honest with you mm. because I had a team now and I'm like, I didn't know how to run the team. And I really had to change the way I lead. And, and that's what is so fun about leadership and the journey of leadership is that, well, maybe it's not fun, but you have to change to be successful. And I'm like, right. and I realized that. And so I really, you know, embrace sort of really becoming the best I could be at managing a team. And that was hard because we were growing. And so even the type of person you needed was changing to do these jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I just started finding ways to add value and to do what I did best. And then when I got into this regional role, I really realized that we had great systems. We had great processes. Nobody in Latin America knew about what this discipline was. So I was going to have to really focus on leadership and mm. that's really training and mentoring and making something complex because like yield management systems and data and analytics is complex, making it simple. Right, right, right. Tangible to human beings on the yeah. ground who, yeah. 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 Oh, you said that so beautifully. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Make it real. And I found fun and interesting ways that worked with the culture to yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many, just give me a sense, I mean, over the years, like how many other women executives were you around or were you an outlier or I don't know how, what that, 
what that yeah, kind of I mean, industry well, was like back then mm, <laughs> when you started. You, well, I think it's really interesting. Um, I think when I started, it was probably, you know, in a global company, you had maybe about 10% that were women. And then when you go into these countries in Latin America, Mexico or Colombia or Brazil, it was even less. And so immediately I became a very big role model for a lot of women. We had a lot of women in sales and marketing. And I realized immediately the impact that I could make. And at the same time, the impact that they were having on my life by being able to help them grow and develop and think differently and be concerned about them. I mean, they equally impacted me in in ways beyond I can even probably talk about um, just really profoundly. So, mm. but I think today, right, those numbers are, are a little bit different. It's yeah. 30%. Um, and, you know, if you think about Latino women or black women or Asian women, those numbers are really still very low. Right. And if you think right. of different countries, you know, different countries still are struggling. I think like Italy is about 28%. Japan is like 10 So we still have a lot of work to do to, to really get more women in leadership. Mm. Now, where you're, uh, you had a lot of bosses over the years, I'm sure. Because even when you're high up, you still got a boss. Yeah. <laughs> Reflecting back on some of the best bosses or the better boss experiences that you had in terms of giving feedback and supporting you in, in your growth and development, what, what are some of the, the highlights of your career in terms of people who supported you? Oh, there's so many highlights. Um, I think that I would come up with really out of the box ideas. And so I had, <laughs> I had, <laughs> you, you got to give us one, Chris, I'm sorry. Yeah, you got, well, yeah. <laughs> so I said, look, I want to create a workshop that doesn't focus on the process of strategy, um, but focuses on the team. Again, back then that was kind of, we didn't do that. Right. And I said, and I want to make it kind of off of, um, off of that show, the, you know, um, the amazing race, but I'm going to call it the amazing race for revenue. So like, you know, that, that's kind of an out of the box idea, right? How did this play out? Like what were people supposed to, were they like, well, so it was like a discovery day long workshop where they would travel around the world. And, and really it was about enhancing the team and the roles and responsibilities in this revenue strategy meeting. And that's really what was part of the challenge was the teamwork and the synergy. And we actually had, I measured the return on the investment of this. And at the end, I yeah. mean, oh, oh yeah, we each hotel had to set metrics. Yeah. Of what this would do. And we actually were able to grow market share by, I think, an additional point that year over our goal. That's huge. Wow. And so my point is you can do something that's fun and innovative and different and yet still drive great results. Mm. And so my best boss, let's get back to that, you know, I think is somebody that like saw the talent and saw the uh, you know abilities and allowed you know me to um you know kind of do some of these things that might have been a little out of the box or not mainstream mm -hmm. and and then create this success so i think your best boss is one that really understands what you're best at doing and allows you to do it right um, supports you in that supports yeah. you supports you in that um and i think that that's that's incredible and yeah, that, I think that's incredible. I'm trying to think of, I mean, I have so many, every boss I learned something from, I think one time I want to share this story. I, we were going through mergers and acquisitions and, and reorganization. I think everybody in corporate is used to this now, but it's a scary time as a leader. Cause you're right. like, what's, where am I going to land? What am I going to do? Maybe I want to do something different. Could, is this the opportunity to do that? And so I went to my boss who was the president and I said, Hey, do you have any advice for me to get through this time? And, and I think this is great advice. He's like, keep your head down and just keep working. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. But, but I did that. Okay. So let's just say, okay, I listened. I did that. And mm -hmm. what happened was I got a huge promotion within another year. And it's oh. about this idea of mastery just keep getting better at what you're doing, what you're doing. And, yeah. and enjoy and love what you're doing because right. success will follow that. That's really what he was saying, although he right. kind of said it in that 
other way. Right. And I'm like, I will always be grateful for that advice because it really made such a big impact on me. So many things are coming up. So uh, one of the things that I want to get out of you is because I think you have this real strength. I sense that you have a real strength in getting creative around problems and, you know, innovation, essentially. And uh, I I don't know, you know, we tend to equate innovation and radical change and disruption with startups and and, you know. 20 somethings and startups who are, you know, they're open and they're open minded, but you're doing this in a legacy. Com- I'm a company that has quite a legacy. Yeah. It's, it's been around a while. It's very well established. It has a hierarchy and you're, you're in your role, you're, you're creative and you're generating new things. Some of those probably failed. Some of them succeeded, but you kept doing it. How did you keep that creative space fresh and always in a di- I mean, I'm sure you're going to tell me you were learning things, but what are some of the tactics that you use, the strategies you use to stay creative and to get new ideas in? So I'm going to go in a different direction here, but answering your question. So I had a profound life-changing experience through traveling. So we meet people traveling that we never would have met otherwise and in business. And I had an opportunity, um, it's a long story, to have dinner with a world famous designer and a friend of mine met met this person and said I think you might get along with my friend and so I was in this country and this is where this person was and so we met for dinner and in in listening to this amazing story about how he created these incredible designs it was really about finding inspiration and a lot of people you know, I think today one of the things leaders have to do is inspire people. And so, so like he would show me, like he spent time with the Indians in the Amazon and then showed me the designs that came out of it. And really that inspiration is everywhere. And so when I start any project, you know, I start with finding inspiration because it's a spark that helps that acceleration. And so when you think about that in anything you want to do, it's like, what's the inspiration and how does that help and how do you inspire others to start creating this movement or this change or this transformation and finding ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And that really, I think, sets me apart. But a lot of people think it's just sort of, you know, oh, an inspirational quote. It could be. Um, you read an article about how a leader did something completely differently than, than the way that anyone else did. And you can share that story. I mean, there's lots of ways, but that is something that always, and I would get ready to do these like big revenue strategy calls where we would roll out, you know, kind of how we were going to make our money the next year. And I would always have a theme because Mm. the theme was just something that everyone could get behind. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. It was something that carried throughout the year. And I think people are looking for something that keeps them, again, that acceleration that gets them going. And they have to latch onto something. You have to have something they can, a train that they can jump onto and grab onto, you know? What what were some of the things? Go on, sorry. No, go ahead. What were some of the themes that you Oh my goodness. Um, and then, (laughs) and then we would do crazy like pictures. Like there was, you know, um, one was like ride the wave of success (laughs) and we had surf surfboard theme, you know, kind of surfer theme. And then we would pull that through all year with like quarterly awards and, um, you know, that would be like, it kind of show up in our monthly calls and, you know, so it was something, and then, then we had hotels that would do their own theme parties around it, which was really fun. Um, you know, so every year was different. Um, I, I have a lot of visuals coming into my head around yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but I think you can find a way. And today with so much going on in the world, people just want to have a little bit of fun and yet still be held accountable and still drive results. And so I think it's a great idea for someone who's willing to take the next leap is to kind of think differently about how you get somewhere or how you start right. that that acceleration towards something new. Right. 
So by definition, a leader has people that they're hope ostensibly leading. <laughs> I mean, you can have a leadership role and not be a real leader. Uh, the title doesn't make you the leader, I, I should say. Yes. Uh, it really is people's choice to follow you. Um, and let's face it, I mean, people issues are, that's what keeps most, not entirely, I don't want to, but most of the time, it's people issues that keep people up at night, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that seems like pretty true. <laughs> and I'm wondering when you would run into of all the people that you've led over the years and the people you're helping now who are in leadership, when, when you, when you get in that place of being stuck, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this quagmire. I've got, I got a person who's just not right for this role or who's mm-hmm. in conf two good people who just can't figure it out with each other. And no matter what I do, they just, they fight. And I got to get this sorted or someone's got to go or something like what would you do when you first realize this isn't something I can ignore? I've got to do something, but I don't know what to do. I guess that's what I'm really trying to get at. I don't know what to do, but it's a problem. What does Chris Holder do in that situation? In that situation, you know, there's something that we we had a ground rule in one of the teams that I worked in, and it was about assuming positive intent. Assuming positive positive intent. intent. And when you assume positive intent or when you flip it to say, what do you think the other person is going through right now? Um, And put yourself in their shoes. Oftentimes that's when thinking or behavior really changes. Um, one of the things that I did across the organization, across many organizations outside of my everyday job was create strength-based teams where we really got to know people in a new way and what they were best at doing. There was this gentleman that would always come up and he'd talk close, close talker, and he'd, <laughs> a close he'd say, talker. <laughs> yeah. He'd be like, <laughs> yeah. what's going on? And he'd be very controversial, controversial and, <laughs> oh, and, hmm. and contentious. And I'm like, so I'm like, I don't know what to do about this. Right. To your point. But yeah. then I learned that he had this ability to create this controversy in a way of solving problems. Mm. And when I assumed positive intent and I really understood it, it changed everything. And so wow. when I talk to, you know, when I coach individuals and let's say it's two individuals that aren't getting along and I coach them separately, that's the type of stuff I start digging into. Yes. And then it's also about like, how can you be of service to this person that's really fighting you? Right. Because maybe, um, maybe there's something they really need, and that's causing the fight. And so, that's how do you flip so, that? So true, that's so right? True. That is, folks, this is this is like wisdom beyond wisdom. I mean, it's we see it in our work and my company side. We we help turn around troubled teams, and that is really the gold. It's it's like these assumptions build up; they become a narrative. And, and it's like, well, Chris doesn't care about me. Chris only cares about herself. She's, she doesn't, you know, and I just build this cartoon character yeah. out of you. I dehumanize you essentially. Mm-hmm. And then every interaction we have, I uh, reinforce that because I see it through that lens. Yeah. And pretty soon we can't talk to each other. Yeah. I mean, it just, so that grace of maybe staying open to what Chris's intention is. I actually don't know it. And staying open to that is such the key to understanding things in a completely different context. Yeah. And I also think, you know, one of the other big lessons I had was, you know, when you're young and you're, you're going through the ranks, I mean, you want to, you have a lot of ego and you want to be the best. And so you want your ideas to win. Mm -hmm. Well, how stupid is that? Isn't Mm -hmm. it about the best idea wins? And so if you get de- untied and unbound to your idea of winning, but trying to find the best solution, that also takes away a lot of conflict. Right. And yeah, celebrating the right solution. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's a hard one for, again, emerging leaders to really understand, but it's about embracing the best idea and, and yeah. allowing people to kind of wrestle with each other in order to find it. Well, I think it's a question a lot of leaders and probably a lot of our clients uh, 
need to constantly, re- and ourselves too, but need to constantly reflect on is what am I rewarding? What are the signals I'm sending to my, to my direct reports about who's valued and who's not? Um, I don't know about you, but one of the things I've been learning about the last 10 years in particular is working with people who have some form of ADD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are a lot of people out there who have some, they're on what are, I don't know if it's a spectrum, I'm not a doctor in this yes. area, but there are different forms of it. And what I've, and it used to drive me absolutely insane. I was like, why can't we, you know, it's obvious. That was one of the things I, I well, it's obvious what we should do. Cause in my mind, yeah, it's logical to do this. Well, guess what? First of all, that may be true, but it's not necessarily the most creative solution for something. So what I've st- what I've learned in working with people who have who have the creative brilliance of being ADD is that they often put things together that I would never put together. Yeah. But it's little things that I do, my assumptions, the way I think the world should be, and and I send that signal out. And what I'm basically doing is stifling them, so they learn not to say anything, and then the best idea doesn't win. That's why it's all about the richness and diversity of the talent. And if we think about any of those things like ADD or dyslexia as a superpower, Mm -hmm. and we embrace that as a superpower, um, it kind of changes everything. And I have a a granddaughter with ADD and and it's like, well, let's embrace the way of how you see the world because 99% of the people don't have that. And how do you use that to, right. to be your best? Yeah. I mean, we, we, I think organizations around the world need to do a better job of making, creating space for those people of difference in all different types of difference, yeah. because they do bring so much creative energy to things where you're like, wow, I never would have seen it that way. And that's brilliant. And it's happened over and over again to the point where I'm like, it's so frustrating. It still creates friction points, of course, but it's like the net gain is way bigger if I if I stay open. Yeah. And there's things that organizations still have to do to kind of um, kind of break that unconscious bias. Right. Right. You know, we need champions that are championing, you know, um, and you're seeing that a lot now with. A lot, you know, there's a lot more women support groups in leadership than there ever right. have been. When I right. was coming up through the ranks, we didn't have that, right. you know, and now most companies have that type of thing in place and they might sure. have something in place for LGBT and, you know, all that stuff, um, which is so important because you need a safe space <clears throat> to be able to be yourself and to try to tackle some of this unconscious bias. But we also need to create an environment that rewards people for calling it out. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I would actually, you know, a friend of mine who works in um, a DE&I related field um, said to me one time, we were talking about, um, I I, I was using the word allyship or being an ally. And um, and he says to me, (laughs) I just, I'll never forget this. I don't want an ally. I want a (laughs) co-conspirator. Wow. <laughs> and I went, that is brilliant. Because if yeah. you think about it in terms of countries, allies, mm-hmm. allies can be a bit fickle. Yeah. They're like, I'm an ally, but my e- economic interest isn't met here. So in this case, I'm going to stay silent while you get pummeled over there. And a co conspirator, in the positive sense, yeah. it's not usually a yeah. positive thing, is like, I'm in this with you. Our, yeah. our fate is intertwined. If I speak up for you, I am actually helping all of us. Yeah. And I think that difference just for me, just I'll never forget that, that phrase. I never that's forget a, it. That's a super interesting way. I mean, I call it champion, you know, yeah. like yes. always championing, um, that, um, and, and doing that rally call. But I love that. Absolutely yeah. love that. It's more provocative in a sense, yes. but it, yeah. it, I just think it's, it really spoke to, um, how we can continually work on the language that we use around this yeah. this stuff as we all are adjusting to constant change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Co- I'm going to take that away from today. You I can. Uh, you absolutely please spread it. <laughs> spread it. Um, I'm wondering. There's just literally you've got so much 
background and so much wisdom, so many stories that we could never get to all of it. And so I'm not even going to attempt. And I, I just, I feel this internal tension that I'm not honoring all those years with pulling more out of you, but I kind of want to know more about you and the journey, that internal journey, when you made the decision about the direction you were going to go in next. And what has this leap, what is your big leap to this next thing, this journey, what has it taught you about yourself? What are some of the insights? How, how has it changed you and how you see yourself? Yeah. Well, let's go a little deep here. This, this is good. I don't do this very often, but okay. I, I really believe that, um, and I did that. I didn't know I did this, but I did this. Like I really had this ability intuitively um, to make the fu future happen today in my corporate job. I've had to relearn how to do that as a human being, as you know, a new business owner, and and how do I take that magic that I had? and create that magic in this new world and and sometimes in this push 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 because you know in corporate you get a paycheck so right you you can show up and do nothing and get a paycheck here if you don't do anything you don't get a paycheck mm -hmm. and so the it can be a lot more um um really like kind of catabolic negative energy for entrepreneurs and i said i'm going to do this in a different way I'm going to do this where I pull things into me. I'm going to do this where it's fun and with ease and flow. And so have I gotten stuck? Yes. But now mm -hmm. I sort of have a method that I've taught myself to get unstuck. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I've transformed. I, I had high emotional intelligence. You'd have to, to be a woman working in Latin America, right? Yeah, and, right. <laughs> and growing, developing countries and you know, all those things. But my emotional intelligence and just my, I think my spirituality has expanded immensely. Wow. And so when I think about, oh yeah, I have all that stuff I can bring to people, but now I have this different way of seeing the world that I'd love to have more people see the world in corporate America, it's not about push, push, push. Mm -hmm. Of course there's that, but it doesn't have to be that way the whole time. Mm -hmm. It can be, and, and I loved what I did. It was like my dream job, but I say I'm in my second dream job. But so I've had to really learn to say, how do I take the magic from what I did and bring it into what I do today? And mm -hmm. I've gotten so much more insight on how I actually did all of that. Like someone would say, I really want to learn from you how to, how to create the future. And I was like dumbfounded. I couldn't do it. Now mm -hmm. I actually sort of have a bit of a roadmap that I can walk people through to get them really with that acceleration, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I've had to now kind of say, how do I apply this to myself? And then when I get stuck, what do I do? And, mm -hmm. and the other thing I've learned is grace. Like when you get stuck, give yourself grace. <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah. like take oh, yes. time, step away. I mean, I got to a point where it's like, not everything is that important in my corporate world, but now it's like, now this is one step further. It's like, okay, let's have grace. Mm -hmm. Let's have compassion for yourself. Let's just let something be and go do something you really enjoy and come back. Right. And every time you do that and you renew and you refresh, um, something new drops in that you want to do. Um, so and it's, yeah. you know, and then, you know, you've got to surround yourself with communities and, and you're transforming really fast in your first year. You're going through so much to change. Mm -hmm. And you also have to know when it's time to kind of step away from something yeah. that you've been a part of, like a community and move to something else. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. Because like if, for someone that worked in a corporate environment for 30 <laughs> plus years, this idea of shifting to some new community or somewhere that might be able to help me get to that next step is that's a hard thing for me to do. And I've had to yeah. say, how is this really serving me right now? How, how am I feeling about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, intuitively, I know probably, but like really, um, feeling free to kind of move on when it doesn't serve you anymore. That's hard. Absolutely. That's hard. It is and hard. I think a lot of people yeah. are feeling that way right now in life. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, you know, I now have the ability to really work with people to kind of, to kind of walk through those things. Cause I've, I've had to walk through that in this new world. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And I, it really resonates with me. The, the spiritual journey, uh, doing your thing, building, building your own thing. Um, it is a spiritual journey as much as anything. Um, when you're in an organization that has a lot of structure yeah. to it, your zone, your domain of creativity and focus is, it's it's a luxury, it's also a box, but it's also a luxury that you can kind of, okay, this is gonna be taken care of over here, I know who's who, and I can focus on this. This is what I have in it. But then when it's yours, it's all you. And yeah. gaining, and I talk about this constantly on the podcast, perspective, perspective, perspective. It's just like, it's a constant coming into perspective and oh, now I'm not, I, I'm, I lost my perspective. Yeah. Should I be in this community? Is this working for me? I don't know. Am I good at what I'm doing? I don't know about that anymore either. And it can just be, <laughs> it's a spiritual journey. If you're not, if you're not spiritually centered, it, you're just not going to be able to get through all of the self-doubt and the no, no. All and there's things stuff. that, again, I did at Quipper that I brought with me, like perfectly yeah. imperfect. Things don't have to be perfect. So not yeah. everybody might be at that level, but like, I'm right. like, I, I, I'm okay with perfectly imperfect. Like I did a presentation <laughs> and I had a couple spelling errors. I'm not a speller. It's a long story, but I'm not a speller. Yeah. And I said to the group and I said, oh, I see I have a spelling error. I said, that's not my zone of genius. And I was just fine with it. Yeah. Some people like were mortified about it. Right. And I could right. have gotten all upset about it, but I chose, again, it's about a choice to just go, right. this isn't what I'm best at. And I did a smell check and I guess I didn't catch this. Right. Um, and I didn't care. <sighs> and so great. sometimes you just don't have to care. Yes. Letting go of that. Let it go. Perfection and and not problem, everybody yeah. is for you and that's okay. Yeah. Very true. Very, very true. So let's talk about who you're working with now and what's bringing you joy and how you're helping your clients for a few minutes. Cause I know you are. And, um, first of all, what, how, who have you been drawn to or who's being drawn to you now? Cause I was thinking, you know, after that long in hospitality, it would be natural to then work with executives in hospitality. Um, but what you've learned absolutely goes beyond the hospitality leadership space. I mean, for sure, it applies to all kinds of different industries and types of people. Yeah. So who do you find the, the universe sort of drawing toward you and drawing you to right now? Well, <laughs> you know, I work with I work with businesses and oftentimes I'll go in sort of as that in-house coach that can really um, do some deep work, um, leveling up people, you know, really um, spending time, you know, accelerating their leadership on behalf of the organization aligned to the organization's culture. And that's been really rewarding. Mm. Um, so um, I really love that. And I've been working in multiple industries in retail, in high tech, in startups. And, and again, I think that creative thinking that um, I bring to the table is really well received. And so you know, everybody has like sort of a leadership development opportunity and they're all different. And so because I like develop parts of the world that we didn't have a presence in, I mean, I've done so many different things that I can really um, help leaders. So that's super fun for me. And then just to, you know, like just to see the transformation physically, you know, mm. happen on these, most of it is all Zoom is is fantastic. Also, I'll work with companies to go in and bring um, a workshop or new way of doing things and to solve the leader's problem. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? Solve the problem. Like I had one company that needed um, to do a better job influencing the business had changed, they're rolling uh -huh. out new new technology. And so we did this influencing workshop and they even got like a practical cheat sheet of how to prepare for a talk. And they're like, that was perfect, Chris. <laughs> like, so it's like, listen deeply, go beyond, solve the business problem. And, mm -hmm. and that, that brings me so much joy that, you know, mm -hmm. we were able to really at a deep level, give them things that they could actually do practically to make the changes they needed to make. And then through that transformation that we're talking about, I was really um, quite visible on my personal 
um, social media. And so there's mm -hmm. been a lot of people that have been drawn in in watching this transformation happen. Right. And a lot of women, I do both I'm men and women and and right. and I have great clients in both, but there's a lot of women out there that are feeling um I guess I would say unfulfilled in some way. Right. And they really want to kind of figure it out how to get back in the groove. And so um, I've had people that have gotten their dream job working with me. You know, I've had people that went from zero confidence to like nailing it and getting a promotion at work, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's just super fun to see the change and then to see the ripple effects mm -hmm. because they're starting to show up differently in meetings and asking different questions with. So it kind of, again, it gets, it, it expands beyond me and there's nothing better when I hear like, I, I heard you channeling through me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's. I don't you know, that's were with me bad. in the room when this happened. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a special impact on others. Um, yeah. Whether you're a coach or not, your words really matter. Sure. They really yeah. do. They really stick. I mean, you can look back on your career and you, you probably remember sentences yeah. that were uttered by a colleague or a boss or somebody, a customer even, that stick with you yeah. forever. Yeah. And yeah. Matt, one more thing, it, it kind of goes beyond words. It's about moments that matter mm. and consciously yes. yeah. um, recognizing when that happens and leaning into it. So as an example, I had a leader that called me and said, I'm done with this job. I'm sure I'm not the only one that have had that has had that call. And I said, well, how long have you been there? Oh, I've been here six months. I'm like, okay, well, how long did you agree to be there? Two years. Okay. So, so again, I recognize this is like a moment that could really matter for this individual. Right, right. And so I just, I started saying, okay, so what, what's the legacy you're leaving at six months? Uh, well, I, I, not, he, he just, he wasn't in the groove. He was and he, and he's like, well, I'm not. Oh, so is that the way you want to leave this job? And so it's like, how do you really create these moments for individuals that change everything that go beyond words. And right. so to this day, I get a Christmas greeting from this <laughs> individual that says, boss, you changed my life with that conversation. Cause guess what? He stayed, he created massive success and allowed him to go on to even a bigger job. And he says, I will never forget that conversation that moment it changed everything in how i think about leadership and so i think mm. all of us have that opportunity whether it's with our children yeah. whether it's with a colleague whether it's with somebody that reports to you to create those moments that matter disrupting the narratives that are not helping ourselves right. is is done in partnership and at least for me you know i need others to help me with that <laughs> there are things i can do myself but if I'm in partnership with you and I genuinely believe that you care about me, uh, then, and I'm open to that, then I'm open to hearing something disruptive to the narrative that I'm, yeah. that my fear center is reinforcing, Beautiful. you know, yeah. and that's, and, and so to that point, and I think caring coaches, and you're definitely a caring coach and human being, um, can be so effective 50% of it, I don't know, that's a non-scientific number, but is is how much you actually care, which keeps people open. So I'm wondering, you've been on the inside of an organization that that paid for coaches and paid for trainers and paid for software solutions and vendors and of all sorts. So you've been on the inside of that. Now you're on the external side looking in and going in and helping. Um, why is coaching growing as one of the main tools for helping leaders? What, what's yeah. what's behind that? What do you think? Well, it it one it it's the most personalized way to change behavior and become like your personal best. You know, um, there's nothing that has that type of like leadership. I'll call it intervention. I mean, there's you can go to a a week long training, but think about that. There's no pull through afterwards. Um, right. also organizations are in the middle of complex, challenging times. And so to have somebody that can just do that day to day focus or week to week focus, um, with some, 
you know, impact points. I really believe on this return on coaching and, and what, what is the change we want to make? And I think that's what sets great coaches apart is they actually create sustainable change and it's measurable. Um, and that I think, you know, there's just so many needs. And the other thing is for an executive leadership right now is very lonely. Mm. You can't talk to anybody. So think about holding in all these thoughts and feelings and creating your own narrative without having anybody that's neutral objective that isn't going to hold anything against you that right. you know it, you're not going to look like you're weak by talking about these challenges and you know a coach can be a trusted partner can be an advisor can challenge the way you think can help you accelerate your leadership there's so many different roles in a coach beyond just like the term coaching. And I see a day one day where every executive will have one because the way business is changing so dramatically, um, you just need somebody to be in there to challenge mm. the way you think, to support you in a way that organizations just can't do. And if you're jumping organizations, right, you'll have less and less of those deep, meaningful relationships where That's you can true. typically get that mentorship mm -hmm. and that support. Yeah. The, or if you didn't change, but everyone else is changing around you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's almost the same in a sense, just constant volatility and uh, inability to form a long, yeah. the kind, the level of trust correct, that, and background where you could do, you could weather any storm together. Yeah. That's hard to come by, yeah. um, especially these days. You know, I, th that also resonates because when we go into a troubled team situation, um, Usually the first convert, the first session of talking with the individuals, you, you, the best laid plans, you might as well put them down. What you really, the, the majority, 99% of the time, it's just, it's just saying, talk to me. Mm -hmm. I care. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to betray you. I just want to know how are you feeling? And let, and just that being able to express what it's like to be living in that scenario is just like the air coming out of a balloon. And over and over again, we hear, oh, I just needed to get that out. And you realize how bound up and trapped people feel. They haven't talked to anybody about it like that. Maybe even at home, they're not talking about it. Yeah. And that's so important to be able to get it out in order to move forward. Yeah, I love that. That's really your first approach to going into these teams. They just want to be heard, right? In, in the end of the day, Everyone mm -hmm. just wants to feel heard yeah. and, 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 and seen and, and be able to get out whatever it is they want to get out and to be able to have someone like you that can come in and allow that to happen. I mean, that's a gift. Yeah. Well, and I, and I, I when I was hearing you talk about it, it's just like um, having that space that's yeah. not with a colleague, someone that you could, yeah. there could be real consequences for discussing it in that way it's yeah. such a refuge to have a good coach who really cares and listens and and allows you to, to get that out what does a uh, couple last last points here before we break but um you know i the term future ready uh, i mean every term has basically become bastardized at some level I mean, <laughs> nothing means anything anymore no. but let's try and give it some meaning um what does future, you've dealt with so much volatility and you talked about those plans you had to make for all these different countries with coups going on and other things. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that experience. What is a, a leader right now who's like, I feel the ground shifting. I don't even know what's shifting. I got to get ready for change and I don't even know every avenue of change. I don't even, I can't even see around every corner. What are a few things that they need to be doing right now to be truly future ready? Yeah. So everyone needs to learn agility. I mean, that's, that's like agility is number one because, you know, anything pre to the you know, pre pandemic is gone and we don't know what there's going to be dramatic change moving forward. So this idea of agile, which is hard because that means you've got change today, tomorrow, the next day. And so how do you just stay centered mm -hmm. and look at things as an opportunity um, is, is so critical to success. And then the other thing is, is don't, this is a big one, and this is what I did, but don't wait for an organization to 
train you, to give you the insight. You are responsible for your own life and living Mm -hmm. it in the best possible way. And so you need to find ways to build out what you're best at doing beyond what an organization will do for you. And when you do that, you will be successful no matter what happens. And I went and got my own MBA, right? I became a certified professional coach. I was always investing in myself and building out a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, just like I was doing in my job um, in driving top line revenues. But Mm -hmm. people have to do the same thing. I mean, there's this new concept about multiple streams of income. Maybe there's something you're passionate about. Maybe it's like you love to journal and you want to create a journal and you want to sell it on Amazon. So expand beyond the job and 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 you okay so people are sitting here going well i don't have time if it's important to living your best life take an hour at lunch a day like or 30 minutes on friday after i mean do right. something for yourself to to continue to build out kind of your own arsenal and to your point earlier there's so many different ways to do that today you can listen to podcasts but don't just listen to the podcast take something and put it in place afterwards right do right? something yes do yes something. yes and, yes and and really your again my favorite quote of all times is life isn't about finding yourself it's about creating yourself and go out and create yourself i don't know how better to end this podcast <laughs> go out and create yourself yeah and keep recreating yourself yeah and own it yep it's not your employer that's going to bring it to you you got to go get it. tell your employer what you want and if they don't yes. want it go do it anyway yeah i love that i love that chris we could talk for probably three months straight um and i know i would never get bored um but um i just want to thank you for bringing your great wisdom and your heart and your good humor to this conversation. I know it's going to help some people. If if somebody wants to engage with you, where do you want? You have a website, you've got LinkedIn. Where do you want people to go first to find you? I think you could just send me an email, chris at chris, C-H-R-I-S hyphen or dash holter.com. And I'm happy to get on a call with anybody and spend 20 minutes just talking and and seeing how we can accelerate your way forward. <laughs> I love it. Chris hyphen Holter, just how it sounds, phonetically sound yeah. at. No, it's at Chris, Hol- at Chris at Chris at Chris dash Holter. Yeah. Dot com. Very Sorry. simple. I'm already messing it up. I'll <laughs> make sure okay. to put it in the description as well. <laughs> so it's there. You cannot not find Chris Holter if you want to. And I'm so glad I found you. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Matt, this was awesome. You're awesome. And thanks for doing what you do to help so many people. I know so many benefiting from your podcast. Likewise. Thank you so, so much. 